For the next half hour, you and I will be turning back the hands of time. We're going to be investigating a rabbit hole that very few have been to the bottom of, and I plan to take you all there today. That of a mother of two who spontaneously disappeared from her home without a trace. It genuinely blows my mind that this case isn't covered more on YouTube, as it's one of the most intriguing and baffling stories I've ever heard. As you'll quickly come to find out, trying to get to the bottom of what happened here is like trying to play a game of whack-a-mole. Right when you think you've hit the nail on the head, ten other clues come out of nowhere and completely throw you off track. This is the uncanny disappearance of Joan Reish. We now find ourselves on the 24th of October, 1961, in the somewhat rural town of Lincoln, Massachusetts, situated just northwest of Boston. It's daybreak, around 6.40 a.m. A slight orange hue can barely be seen through the trees, the sun barely beginning to light up the starlit sky. You are following behind me as my flashlight leads the way up a narrow road surrounded by a forest of orange trees. Ahead of us, to the left, sits the home of Joan Reish, a 31-year-old mother of two. Just as we begin to approach the house in question, a man exits through the front door and begins walking down the driveway. I stop in my tracks, struggling to flick off the flashlight before tugging on your jacket, pulling us into the cover of the tree line. That man up there is Martin Reich, husband to Joan Reich. He's heading into Boston to catch a flight to New York for a business trip. It departs in around an hour, so he hasn't given himself much leeway. Then again, he hasn't got to deal with TSA. Once the coast is clear, we walk back out onto the road before stopping in front of the house. As we're passing by, you notice a light flick on and the silhouette of a thin woman pass in front of the window. That's her. We take a quick glance at the home before continuing down the street so as to not attract any unnecessary attention to ourselves. By the end of the day, something terrible will happen to that woman. In a matter of hours, the kitchen at the Reich home would look like this. With Joan, nowhere to be found. I want to start off our investigation with a newspaper article which was published from the Boston Record American only a couple months after Joan's disappearance. The article contains plenty of information which will help us establish a timeline for that day. As we just witnessed for ourselves, early that morning, Joan's husband, Martin, left for New York on a business trip. He planned on staying overnight in Manhattan, and the whole trip was planned well in advance. Now, the couple had two children, a daughter named Lillian, who was only four years old, and baby David, who was just two. Shortly after Martin left for his business trip that morning, Joan would wake up the two children, feed them breakfast, and then take little David across the street to Barbara Barker's house. She then took Lillian to a dentist appointment in her 1951 Chevrolet and briefly ran some errands. During that time, the milkman and mailman both stopped at the house to make their deliveries. Both of them were eventually tracked down and questioned, but neither of them saw anything suspicious. Joan and Lillian then returned shortly after 11 o'clock and picked up David from the neighbors. 
A brief amount of time later, W.F. Colburn, an employee of Dud's Dry Cleaners, stopped by the house as he usually did on Tuesdays to pick up several of her husband's suits. He entered the Reesh home during the visit and reported later that, again, nothing seemed amiss. He also reported that it was typical of Joan to leave her doors unlocked, a common practice back in those days. After his departure, Joan then changed into a more comfortable outfit, a blue dress and sneakers, before feeding the children lunch and putting David in his crib upstairs for a nap, which typically lasted until around 2 p.m. By 1 o'clock, the same neighbor from earlier, Barbara Barker, brought over her son, Douglas, who was the same age as Lillian, to play. During the visit, Joan pruned some plants in the yard and was seemingly acting normal. However, within around an hour, Joan took the children back across the street to Barbara's without informing her, telling the two children that she would be back before they went to play on the swing set. Here's where things start to get quite strange. Shortly thereafter, at around 2.30, Barbara, looking out her bedroom window and through the trees, spotted Joan walking fast, maybe even running up her driveway. The following is a quote from her testimony given the same day the incident occurred. I saw Joan around 2.30 p.m. I saw her run beside her car. She had a trench coat on at this time. I saw something red. I thought that she was chasing a child and the child was wearing a red jacket. She was running with her arms outstretched. Later, I saw her walking back towards the house. At the time, Barbara thought Joan was chasing one of the children, unaware that they were both actually playing in her yard. Her view at this point was out from her kitchen window, and because of her viewing angle, she wasn't able to see if there was another car in the driveway. Joan quickly was obscured by the trees as she approached the house, and that was the last time anyone ever saw her. Virginia Keene, a 13-year-old girl who lived next door to the Reesh home, actually has stated that she did see an unfamiliar car parked behind Jones in the driveway that morning. She says it was parked nearby the road and was two-tone, with one of the colors being either a gray or a blue. After some later speculation, she believed it to be a 1954 Plymouth. It would come out during the investigation that only several days prior, a man by the name of Bernard Saquette, who was the regular milkman for the Reich household, had actually seen the same blue car parked in the driveway. He saw this while making a regular milk delivery. Now, approximately five minutes after Virginia had seen the car, another resident of the area who was driving down Old Bedford Road was forced to come to a stop by a blue car that was backing out of either the Reeshes or the Keene's driveway. However, both Virginia Keene and her mother stated that there was no car in their driveway at that time. Now, assuming these sightings were accurate and true, Whoever was in that car and whatever they were doing at Joan's house that day remains a mystery. I want you to recall that feeling of childhood bliss. Think of some of the simple memories, any neighborhood friends you might have had, playing on the swings, tag. Close your eyes for a moment and imagine yourself engulfed back in that simplicity. Imagine the sharp October air hitting your skin as you swing back and forth as you laugh. This was life for Lillian Reich on that pivotal autumn day in 1961. The blue car had just backed out of Joan's driveway and pulled out down Old Bedford Road. Perhaps Lillian even heard the engine as it drove off.
A mere 10 minutes later, Barbara informed Lillian that Douglas and her needed to run some errands, and she would have to be dropped off back at home. Barbara saw Joan's Chevrolet still parked in the driveway, so she had to still be home. As Barbara drove off with her son, Lillian ran up the driveway before opening the door to her home and closing it on the world she once knew. Coming from upstairs, Lillian could hear her baby brother crying in his crib. The boy always woke up from his afternoon nap by around 2 o'clock, but it was now approaching 4. She entered from the garage door, which led directly into the kitchen. Lillian was unaware of what she was looking at. The scene before her could simply not be processed by a four-year-old mind. She didn't see blood, she simply saw red liquid spilled across the floor. Books and magazines were strewn about along with a small table which lay on its side. Astonishingly, Lillian simply sidestepped this table and went upstairs to her and David's shared bedroom. She likely called for her mother, maybe poked around a bit trying to find her, but Joan was nowhere to be found. It's not clear what else she did while inside the home. In all likelihood, she simply remained upstairs with her brother and played with her toys. If that isn't the definition of innocence, I don't know what is. Around 30 minutes passed. It was now 4.15 p.m. Barbara and Douglas had just returned back home when Lillian skipped back down the driveway and across the street. Barbara was surprised to see the little girl standing on her doorstep so soon after dropping her off. What she said next has become somewhat of an infamous quote. Mommy is gone, and the kitchen is covered with red paint. Barbara quickly ran over to the house, let herself inside, and was terrified at the horrific scene in front of her. After gathering a few others in search of Joan to no avail, she rang the Lincoln police at 4.33 p.m., who would arrive within five minutes of the call. Let's head over there and see what we can find before they show up. The Backyard of the Reich Household, October 24th, 1961, 4.35 p.m. We've only got a couple of minutes, so let's make this quick. Watch your step. We don't want to mess with the evidence. Looking around, something horrible clearly happened here. Exactly what that could have been isn't immediately apparent. As you might have noticed, there's a lot of blood, particularly on the floor, but also smeared across the walls. If you look just in front of you, you'll notice the rotary wall phone. A closer look reveals a missing receiver. Odd. So, 
Where's the receiver, you might ask? Well, it's right over here, hooked over the side of an overflowing trash can placed in the middle of the kitchen. It appears as though it was ripped clean off the hook. Now, I won't make you sift through the trash, but if we take a look inside, we'll find a can of spaghetti, paper cups, an empty liquor bottle, and some empty beer bottles. There's also an empty carton of Miller High Life next to it. Martin Reich later would state that he and his wife had finished the liquor the night prior, but had no idea where the beer had come from. A large roll of paper towels also sits strewn about on the floor. Two books also sit in front of it. One of them, a children's book, Little Cottontail. It's easy to get swept up in the mystery and allure of this case, but to have actually known this woman, to be robbed of your own mother at such a young age. Where we come from, this all happened over 60 years ago. It's easy to feel disconnected from this place, but then, here, it's just another day in the childhood of these two young children. Lillian was just a little girl. At least David, the two-year-old boy, was likely spared the burden of memory. Lillian might not have been so lucky at four years old. That's kind of why I wanted to take you here. Stepping into this kitchen and poking around for ourselves reveals the humanity here, don't you think? I almost walked right by these. They look like they're two of Lillian's paintings. I remember the kitchen in my childhood home. I used to have the same kinds of things on the wall. Little drawings and projects from art class. <sighs> Looks like we're out of time. We'll discuss theories in just a moment, but for now, let's take a look at the evidence those cops are about to collect. Before even entering the home, the police were greeted with bloodstains in the driveway. It would soon be discovered that the trail led all the way from the driveway into the kitchen, or maybe the other way around. It was impossible to say where the bleeding had originated from. They first noticed it at Joan's car, which had blood on the right rear fender, the left side of the hood near the windshield, and the very center of the trunk. Upon their entry into the home, they, of course, found more blood. Not only in the kitchen, but also upstairs, with a single drop on the first step and two others at the top of the stairway. They found eight drops in the master bedroom and one near a window in the children's bedroom. Again, the investigators were unable to determine where the bleeding had started. The kitchen, driveway, or somewhere upstairs. One of the most pressing questions at that time was whether this was the result of some sort of accidental injury on Joan's part, or whether some sort of a struggle had taken place. Further investigation of the kitchen revealed several bloody footprints on the telephone receiver, as well as a palm print on the wall. However, the police were unable to determine whose prints these were, and a match was never made. The blood was tested and found to be type O, which was known to have been Joan's blood type. However, it is also the most common. It appears that someone momentarily attempted to clean up the blood in the kitchen, 
before quickly giving up. A pair of bloody coveralls belonging to David were also on the floor. It's possible that they were used to try and clean up the room, but again, it's impossible to say. Also found in the kitchen was a local telephone directory opened up to the page with emergency numbers. There's not a lot of information available on this, but to me, it seems to favor the scenario that this was all some big accident. It implies that Joan had enough time to find this phone directory and open it up to the page with the emergency numbers, instead of just running out of the house away from whatever the threat was. Regardless of what happened in that kitchen, whether Joan was deliberately attacked or suffered some form of an accident, there's only two ways that she could have left the property. Either she left in a vehicle, like the one that was seen in her driveway, or she walked off. Now, bloodhounds were actually brought to the house during the investigation, but they only tracked her scent down the driveway and across the street to Barbara's house. They didn't seem to track her going down the street or anywhere around the backyard. Now, the blood trail led halfway down the driveway past Joan's car before it just abruptly stopped, which seems to indicate that she left in a vehicle, willingly or otherwise. However, we can't completely rule out that she wandered off in a disoriented state. There were some very interesting sightings of a strange, disheveled woman in the area which occurred after this point, but we'll get to those soon enough. Hang tight. Next, I think it's important that we cover Martin's account of that day's events. This statement was given at 2.50 a.m. on the 25th of October, just hours after Martin arrived back home following the news. It was given in the presence of seven other police officers. I left my home in Lincoln at approximately 6.50 a.m. on October 24th, 1961. I went directly to Logan Airport driving my own car. I took the 8 o'clock a.m. flight from Eastern Airlines to New York City, LaGuardia Airport. I made a couple of phone calls in the local New York area and then went to 42 West 15th Street to the office of BBM with some paper to be tested. I was with Arthur Kaufman. He tested the paper. We stayed in his office until around 12.45 p.m. when he went out to lunch. After lunch, we went back to his office. I left there around 2.45 p.m. I intended to stay overnight. I received a phone call from Mr. Larson about 7 o'clock p.m. Then I called the state police at Concord, took a cab to LaGuardia, and here I am. Her normal procedure during the daytime was to feed the children at noon and then put the boy to bed. He usually slept until around 2 o'clock p.m. The other child always went across to the neighbors. She never left the children alone. She was an excitable type of person. She might have let salesmen in the house to hear their stories. She found it hard to say no. Now, I'm not sure if you caught that, but it seems like one of the police officers did. He didn't say that she is an excitable type of person. He said that she was an excitable type of person. That's a bit strange. He saw his wife less than 24 hours ago, but he's already talking about her in the past tense, as if she's already gone. Now, Martin's alibi did check out. He definitely was in New York that day, he conducted his business meeting, and he had plans to stay overnight. Therefore, I'm going to write this off as a simple slip-up, but it definitely did catch my attention, and I figured it was worth mentioning. Barbara Barker's testimony has pretty much already been discussed. She had interacted with Joan more than anyone else on that day, and as a result, she's been the main source for the timeline we've already been over. A pivotal part of her testimony, again, is what she saw through her kitchen window at around half past two. I'm going to reiterate what she said because it's extremely important to the case. I saw Joan about 2.30 p.m. I saw her run beside her car. She had a trench coat on at this time. I saw something red. 
I thought that she was chasing a child, and the child was wearing a red jacket. She was running with her arms outstretched. Again, at this point, the baby boy was still upstairs, and Lillian was across the street, so whatever she was looking at couldn't have been one of the children. Now, it's hard to say exactly what she saw, as, again, there were trees obstructing her view of the driveway, and she couldn't see if anybody was parked behind Joan. I think it's about time that we start getting into some theories, starting with the most prevalent of them all, that Joan was attacked. Or that she was kidnapped. I'm kind of bundling these two together as they go hand in hand. So, to begin... Why did Joan bring Lillian and Barbara's child back across the street so quickly? It's possible that Joan heard someone in the house and she took the two children over to the neighbors in haste to deal with this person. However, this is just speculation and isn't backed by any evidence. Either way, for whatever reason, Joan drops Lillian and Barbara's son Douglas back across the street by 2 o'clock and tells them she'll be back. She then heads back home. Now, Lillian doesn't seem to have remembered seeing a second car in the driveway at this point, but again, Virginia and the other local who was driving down the road at the time say that they did a short time later. Another neighborhood resident told investigators that she spotted a blue two-tone car parked on Sunnyside Lane, just down the road from Old Bedford at 4.15. And she was actually able to catch a glimpse of the owner of the vehicle. Reportedly, he was around 5'5", five five, wearing a brown coat. The woman saw him step out of the vehicle, collect some branches from nearby trees, put them in his car, and drive off. So who could this have been? Was this the same car that was seen in the driveway as the incident was occurring? And if so, was this somebody that Joan knew? For now, let's assume that it was someone she didn't know. If we go back to Martin's testimony from earlier, he stated, quote, She was an excitable type of person. She might have let salesmen in the house to hear their stories. She found it hard to say no. Also, according to the dry cleaner, she typically left her doors unlocked, so it is entirely possible that some unknown person gained access to the home. Whether she let them inside, or if they had just walked in on their own accord. However, what if this was someone she did know? Some have speculated that some sort of secret boyfriend had been visiting Joan while her husband was out of town, and that somehow some sort of an altercation had sparked. If you'll recall from earlier, the milkman stated that he believes he saw the same car parked in the driveway just days earlier. This has led some to believe that Joan had some sort of a secret lover, but we'd have to make a lot of assumptions to make that our leading theory. Barbara stated in her testimony that Quote, she is very level-headed. She is not the type to have a man visit her when her husband is away. It's virtually impossible to tell who this attacker might have been, but Joan seems to have been a very family-oriented person. She had just moved here with her husband and two young children. For these reasons, I personally don't believe the whole idea that she was having an affair. However, I'm also not completely sold that this was someone she didn't know. For instance, the beer in the kitchen, which apparently wasn't there that morning when Martin left, seems to imply that someone else had brought it over for themselves, or perhaps for Martin? I'm not quite sure. Also, if the milkman was correct, and he really did see the same car in the driveway several days earlier, that would imply that this was someone who was at least familiar with Joan before the incident. Now, there's another lead that I feel compelled to touch on, and that's something that I found in this document from a detective at the Massachusetts State Police. 
On October 31st, 1961, I talked to Robert W. Foster of 255 Union Street. He stated that he was the agent in charge of securing property to be converted into a shrine for the National Park Service, a branch of the Department of the Interior. He stated that he has been in many homes in the area seeking to get the people to request appraisals of their property with the view of selling the property to the government. On November 1st, 1961, I checked this story because some of the women who were interviewed by Foster felt that he overstayed his visit at their homes. There are just so many strange little pieces of evidence that could either be extremely significant or completely insignificant at the same time. For this reason, at this point in the case, we are unable to conclude who this intruder could have been or whether or not Joan knew them. So this person, whether it's a salesman, some acquaintance, or just some random crazy person, is now in the house. Somehow, a violent altercation occurs, and Joan, unwilling to leave her sleeping son upstairs, decides to try and fight this person off. But she unfortunately gets hurt and runs over to the phone to try and call for help. She's quickly ripped away and is pushed down onto the kitchen floor. However, she was grabbing onto the receiver the entire time, unwilling to let go, and tore it clean out of the wall on her way down. Perhaps at this point she's either completely knocked out or severely injured, and the man picks her up and carries her out to his two-tone car at the bottom of the driveway. Now it's at this point that Barbara, looking through the trees towards the driveway, sees Joan in her tan trench coat with her arms outstretched along with something red. What Barbara had actually seen was the attacker looking down at his bloody hands about to re-enter the house in complete damage control mode. This part of the theory actually makes a lot of sense as Barbara says that she saw Joan wearing her trench coat. And what do you know, the man who was seen on Sunnyside with the blue car picking up sticks just a couple of hours later also was wearing a trench coat. Back inside, he begins trying to clean up the scene, which he quickly realizes is not working, and he gives up, especially when he starts hearing crying coming from upstairs. He heads up, dropping some blood on the steps as well as throughout the hallway. He checks the master bedroom, which explains the blood drops that were found in there, before heading to the actual source of the noise, which is the bedroom. In there, he sees young two-year-old David and realizes that he is of no threat to him and he's not going to be able to give any evidence to the police. It's at this point that he heads back downstairs, out to the car, and drives off with Joan. This is certainly not an impossible sequence of events by any means. However, there are still plenty of unanswered questions. For one, it was later discovered that her coat was missing from the closet, indicating that she had actually intended on leaving the house at that point. Another thing, no commotion or screaming was ever heard by any of the neighbors. It's not impossible to think of a scenario where she might have been knocked unconscious before she could scream for help, but it's still worth noting. It's also hard to imagine that she would have had time to flip through the phone book while she was being assaulted by an intruder, yet it appears as though she did. It's all a bit strange, don't you think? The lack of leads, the confusing crime scene, the whole thing almost sounds like it's straight out of a mystery novel. And maybe it is. I did some digging through newspaper archives in the Boston area in the years following the case, and I came across this article from Wednesday, February 20th, 1963. Apparently, in the months before Joan's disappearance, she checked out at least 10 different books about murders and or disappearances, a few of which contain eerily similar details to her own case. Of vital interest to investigators is the fact that many of the library books brought into the Riche home deal with persons who vanish of their own free will and leave clues to throw off pursuers. 
The possible importance of this information may be gauged in the light of the almost total lack of clues uncovered to date in the case. If we look a bit farther down in the newspaper, we'll see that they actually included the list of books Joan had checked out from the library. Out of all the different works Joan had checked out in these months, the most widely discussed online is one titled Into Thin Air. Allegedly, the case in the book has elements which are eerily similar to Joan's. Now, the newspaper article goes on to state a little bit about each book and how it relates to Joan's case, with Into Thin Air stating that a woman disappears, towel and blood smears are clues. Other similarities across the books listed here continue to be disconcerting. A boy who leaves a military academy and hides in the woods. Autobiography of a leading authority concerning murders and disappearances. A mystery novel in which a man disappears. Biography of a wife who disappears. A schoolboy disappears on purpose. A book he has been reading is a clue. The same newspaper actually ended up interviewing the author of Into Thin Air, who expressed his belief that, due to the similarities between his own book and the actual case, that he thinks Joan is actually out there, alive, and staged the entire scene herself. Now, like me, you're probably wondering, well, what's this book about? What's the plot? It sounds like it might be a key part of the case. So, I looked into the book, and I actually found a copy of it on archive.org, which I flipped through for an hour, but... I don't know, something didn't seem right. It was a crime novel, and somebody did go missing, but some of the details were off. And that's when I realized I had the wrong author, and I was just wasting all my time. So, I tracked down the novel by the correct author, which was Harry Carmichael. That's actually just a pen name, his real name is Leo Ognall and tried to get my hands on a copy. But guys, this is a very obscure book. There are no listings on Amazon, there's no archived versions, and there's not even a little preview on Google. Like, there's nothing. So after I did a little bit more digging, I found that the book actually has an international version, which is titled Put Out That Star. Now, I did actually manage to find one or two of those copies for sale, but they were very expensive due to their rarity and way out of this video's budget. So for that reason, sadly, I can't provide any quotations or a good description of the plot. If anybody watching this by some slim chance does actually have a copy of that book, consider archiving it somewhere online as it may actually hold some significance to this case. With that being said, let's investigate why Joan may have staged her own disappearance and whether or not that lines up with the other facts of the case. Let's start by discussing a very odd and tragic parallel to our current case. The death of Joan's own parents. Although very little information is known about it, on the morning of February 23rd, 1939, in the town of Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, a house fire sparked by a damaged lamp cord set Joan's childhood home ablaze. She was only eight years old at the time, still a young girl, much like Lillian would be, when she lost her mother. This, clearly, would be a tragic precedent in Joan's life. She would then be adopted into a new family. It would have been different if this had occurred at a much younger age, but at eight years old, she certainly had bonded with her parents. To have had her entire life suddenly uprooted and to have been deprived of the life she had known couldn't have been easy. To make matters worse, there is also discussion that she was abused as a child from her new adopted family. Because of the case's age and obscurity, it's very difficult to say if these allegations are true. Furthermore, it's often said that mid-century housewives often felt dissatisfied and lacked a sense of purpose. If we look into the life Joan had been leading up to moving to Lincoln, Massachusetts with Martin, we'll find that she was a very ambitious woman. She graduated with honors at Wilson College in Pennsylvania, where she received a bachelor's in English. This would have been a pretty exceptional achievement as a woman in that era, as they were often expected to play a supporting role at home. 
She didn't stop there, though. She put it to use working at several different publishing houses in New York. From there, however, her life would quickly change. In 1955, she married Martin, and in the following years, they had two children together, and before long, she was living what most would call an average life. So, is it possible that she took off from home, abandoning the family life she had built and pursuing a fast-paced life once again? Maybe, but I don't think so. First, let's return to the mystery books we knew she had been reading. This wasn't exactly a secret or a topic that she had been studying in private. She was open about how much she enjoyed reading mystery and crime novels. It was actually a very popular genre for women at the time, and although it is a bit strange that Into Thin Air seems to have contained some similarities to her own case, I'm personally not convinced that this indicates that she staged the whole thing. In my opinion, because of her clear interest in the genre, it's only logical that a handful of clues in those books would match with those from the scene found at her home. Furthermore, we have to consider the circumstances of the disappearance. This all happened in a very brief amount of time. When so many things could have gone wrong. If she was trying to stage her disappearance, why wouldn't she take off in the middle of the night when there was less chance of being seen, someone stopping by, or for that matter, Barbara bringing her child back home? She also must have known that her little girl would have been the one to come back and find the horrific scene. Why would she put her daughter through that? Not to mention the fact that she would have left David upstairs in his crib. The following is an excerpt from a 1976 Boston Globe article titled, An Open Letter to Joan Reish. It was written by Sabra Morton, one of her close friends from college. My house was on the Concord River, and yours was in that forest. We picked up our friendship at once. We talked in your yard, in my dining room, at Walk-In Pond with my children. We talked about poetry and pregnancies and postnatal depressions. We theorized about child rearing. We obsessed about our children. You loved yours so very deeply. We looked forward to the long-awaited novel that Catherine Ann Porter was about to publish. We talked of your religion, my religion, your washing machine and mine, septic tanks, slip covers, birds. Joan's love for her children was palpable to those around her. She loved her kids and would do anything for them. You could have asked anybody who was in her life at that time, and they would have told you that. From what I've gathered, it just doesn't seem that Joan was dissatisfied with her life. In fact, quite the opposite seems true. Sure, throughout her 20s, she was living out a very ambitious career in the publishing industry, which is exciting, but this new phase of her life also seemed to be very exciting to her as well. They had just moved to a great new neighborhood, they had two beautiful young kids, loving neighbors, I just can't see her abandoning her family, especially in such a traumatizing way. Joan more than anyone knew what it was like to lose your parents in such a horrible way. I don't believe she would have forced that onto her two young children. In my eyes, this wasn't intentional, at least not on her part. Something terrible happened to that woman. Now, some believe she received some sort of an injury while inside of the house. Perhaps she somehow lost consciousness, hit her head, and woke up with a brain injury. From there, maybe in a disoriented state, she opened the list of phone numbers before stumbling over to the phone, where maybe she fell again, ripping the phone cord out from the wall? Perhaps after this, she stumbled down the driveway and walked down to the main road, where she vanished? I don't know. Something very strange that supports this theory is that, apparently while searching the neighborhood, investigators found that several residents had similar sightings of a woman who seemed to resemble Joan. 
At 2.45, a woman wearing clothing similar to what Joan had been wearing, along with a kerchief tied over her head, was seen walking along the north side of Route 2A, west of Old Bedford. The woman appeared to be hunched over, untidy, and seemed to be in a daze. Later, between 3.15 and 3.30, a woman with a similar description was seen with blood running down her legs. This woman also appeared disoriented and was reportedly cradling something against her stomach. A third sighting, reportedly around 4.30 p.m., was of another woman, this time walking south along Route 128 near Trapello Road. It's very difficult to say if any of these reports were actually of Joan. Some characteristics, such as the kerchief over the woman's head, don't seem to line up with what she is actually known to have worn. With that being said, the sighting of the woman with blood running down her legs is very interesting. Some speculate that following her injury, she simply walked off in some strange days trying to find help, but the theory kind of hits a dead end there. I'm not going to dive too deep into this accidental injury theory because it has way more unanswered questions than any of the others. For one, it doesn't explain the sightings of the blue car in the driveway. It also doesn't explain the fact that the blood led from the door and down the driveway before stopping there. No blood was seen on the road or anywhere else off the property. And again, the bloodhounds used by investigators lost Joan's scent at the end of the driveway, implying that she was indeed driven away in a vehicle. So, although we can't discount any of the theories, this one just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I do believe that there's a lot of evidence to support that somebody was there when this all happened, or at least showed up after the fact. This brings us to our final theory. To some, this might seem completely unexpected and way out of left field, but I suspect that to others, this has been in the back of your mind for this entire video. And that's that Joan may have suffered a botched abortion. Wait, what? What about all that stuff about her loving her kids? The perfect little family life? This doesn't fit that narrative at all. I know. The truth is, as much as I feel compelled to paint this part of Joan's life through a rose-tinted filter, there just isn't a lot of information available about Joan's private life. Aside from a few friends, Joan pretty much kept to herself. There's so much that we don't know about her, possibly things that she didn't want anyone to know. Now, during my research for this video, I found that there was sort of a local legend that affairs were very commonplace in the area. However, this was quite a while ago, and I haven't seen any concrete evidence for this, so it's impossible to verify those claims. Either way, if we consider for a moment that Joan did have an affair, got pregnant, and tried to have an abortion, we'll find that the dots connect eerily well. I want to remind you that abortion laws back then were very different than they are today. The procedures back then were sketchy to say the least, and were often performed in secrecy by off-duty medical professionals. There are many cases of women around this time period who would go through these procedures and would pass away hours later after hemorrhaging, so this isn't something we can just brush off. Now, for the sake of this theory, let's assume that somehow Joan really was in an affair and really did get pregnant. Now, I do want to address that this seems like a stretch at first. It doesn't sound like the perfect nuclear family that she had been building up for all these years. But then again, that's kind of a fact of the times. Things in life weren't always perfect, even if the culture back then insisted that they were. Let's assume she somehow got tied up in an affair because 
if she had been pregnant with her husband, it's much more likely that she would have just kept the baby. However, in fear of destroying everything that she had built up to this point, maybe she decides to try and fix her mistake. Let's run down one possible line of events, and we'll review it and modify it once it's laid out. Perhaps Joan gets into contact with a doctor who can conduct the procedure at home and in private. If this person was experienced, the whole thing honestly could have been done in under a half an hour, assuming there were no complications. So, perhaps Joan, aware of the need for secrecy because of the highly illegal nature of the matter, fills her schedule with regular tasks in order to make her day seem inconspicuous. The doctor's visit is arranged to be at 2 o'clock on the dot, so at 1.55, as we know, Joan takes Douglas and Lillian across the street to Barbara's, telling them that she would be back shortly. The doctor, in his blue Plymouth, parks behind Joan in the driveway and enters the home. Now, with the two inside, they decide to have the abortion on the kitchen floor where the cleanup would be easy rather than on a carpet or a bed. One thing that was mentioned in the police report was that a pair of coveralls was sitting in the kitchen covered in blood and it was pressed into the floor almost as though something heavy had been laying on it for quite a while. It's possible that while the operation was happening in the kitchen, she was laying on the coveralls as a sort of cushion. Now, clearly the abortion starts going very wrong and Joan starts bleeding everywhere. She flips through the phone directory trying to find a professional to call before rushing over to the phone. The doctor, aware of what will happen to him if he gets caught, forces Joan away. She grips onto the phone before slipping on the blood and falling to the ground, taking the receiver with her. From there, whether she's knocked unconscious, severely injured, or simply forced into submission by the doctor, she is taken down the driveway and to the car, leaving a trail of blood. This all happened very quickly, as it is now only 2.15, when Barbara, looking out of her kitchen window, through the trees and across the street, sees not Joan, but the doctor with both arms outstretched. The red Barbara had seen was actually him looking down at his bloodied hands in shock as he ran inside to clean up the scene. Back inside, the doctor, in a panic, gets the phone out of the way by racking it over the trash bin, which was placed nearby for convenience during the procedure. He then rips the paper towels down and tries to clean up the bloody scene, only to realize that there was no way he could clean this all up in a timely manner. Besides, if anyone outside walks by Joan laying in the back of the car, it would be over for him. It is now past the time when young David, still upstairs in his crib, is supposed to wake up from his nap. He starts crying. The doctor rushes upstairs to investigate, leaving drops of blood on the stairs and in the hallway. He checks the master bedroom for the source of the sound, leaving a drop of blood in there, before realizing that the child is in another room. He then enters into the children's room, where another drop of blood is left. Upon realizing that David isn't going to be able to give his description to the police, he rushes back downstairs and out to the car, where he takes off. Eventually, she passes away. He then disposes of her somehow, and she's never seen again. This was actually the theory that I personally believed for quite a while, however, there are still a lot of problems with it. For one, scheduling such a secretive and drastic procedure in the middle of the day when anyone could have walked in, including the neighbor or her kid, just doesn't make a lot of sense. This also would have all been done just before the baby was supposed to wake up from his nap, so the timing is off. However, maybe the abortion didn't happen right then. 
Maybe it happened a little bit before. Some have said that it's possible that the abortion was conducted at the dentist appointment earlier that morning, but would she really have tried to accomplish it in such a hasty manner? Especially with her kid tagging along? I don't think so. Maybe it actually was conducted a day or two prior to her disappearance, and Joan suddenly began hemorrhaging sometime before 2 o'clock. Perhaps she then quickly dropped Douglas and Lillian off at the neighbors before rushing back home and calling the doctor from before. From there, it's basically the same line of events as before. He comes over, she wants to go to the hospital, they fight over the phone, she slips and takes the phone down with her. She's loaded into the trunk, Barbara sees him looking down at his hands as he walks back inside, he leaves blood all over the house as he tries to clean up before looking upstairs and finding the baby. Then he comes back down the stairs and drives off with Joan, and apparently she dies after that, and he has to get rid of the evidence. This scenario makes much more sense in accordance with the events of that day, as it doesn't seem that anything was planned for around 2 o'clock. Furthermore, Joan's coat was missing from the closet, but her pocketbook was still there, which to me indicates that Maybe the doctor wanted to cover her up so that nobody would see what was happening. But even this theory, which seems to connect fairly well with the evidence, is still making a lot of assumptions. We're assuming that Joan had an affair while also raising a young, budding family, that she got pregnant during this affair, and that she tried to have an illegal abortion in her kitchen as a result. Obviously, there are a barrage of different potential scenarios that we've covered. There's the possibility that someone entered the home, attacked her, and kidnapped her. There's the possibility that she hurt herself and wandered off. It's even possible that she staged the entire scene in order to return to the life that she left behind. And finally, there's the possibility that she passed away due to a botched abortion. As we approach the end of our investigation into the mysterious disappearance of Joan Reich, we are left with more questions than answers. There's a chance that the truth is some weird mix of all of these different theories, or potentially that it's something completely different that we haven't even thought of. Her story deeply impacted those who knew her, but perhaps none more so than her four-year-old daughter Lillian, who was forced to navigate the world without the guidance of her mother. This young four-year-old girl who was robbed of her own mother in such an abrupt and callous way. I mean, really think about that for a moment. She never had any answers, she never had any closure, she just had this horribly confusing void throughout her developmental years. Again, I say this with the hope that David was spared the memory of that day. What is truly unnerving is the realization that with the passage of time, it is increasingly likely that there isn't a single person alive who knows the truth of what happened to Joan. The threads of this enigma may forever remain tangled in the chronicles of history. This could have been any of our loved ones. Life sometimes can be very cruel. We don't always receive closure and Again, there isn't always a third act to our stories. Let us remember Joan, whose story continues to endure through the years. Let us hold space for Lillian, David, and all those who have experienced similar inexplicable losses. May we never stop seeking answers, for within the depths of mystery lies the potential for closure, understanding, and the hope that one day, the truth will be revealed. <laughs> <laughs>